messages already from their OBs and from other people. We really needed to have a more clear message um, about what fish they could eat. And just give them a list. They, what we heard over and over is, what can I eat? If you told me what not to eat, I don't know what to eat. If we just told them what they should eat, then they could just eat that. And so basically, we came up with this brochure and list of cartoons, and we talked about you know, why you want to eat fish, and that fish is the best way to get DHA, and that supplements were not helping them, but they actually are the best, because it's still high feed, and they're expensive, and um, you know, the data about fish, and then we gave this list of fish, they're 29, and we broke them down by how much, so these are all fish that you can eat, they're all low in mercury, and then we said, you know, if you eat one meal a week of salmon, and you're getting your DHA for your baby that week. If you eat two servings of, you know, trout, you're getting your DHA. If you eat three servings of Blackfish, you're getting your DHA. And these fish are all totally fine to eat, but they just don't have that much DHA when they're free eating them. And so we sort of armed them with this brochure, and we talked sort of on the back page about mercury, but it really wasn't, you know, it wasn't the primary message. We gave a brochure, we went through it in detail, we gave them a wallet card, we gave a wallet card for their husband, for their mother, we gave them a shopping list. And so we sort of, and then we just sent them off. And so we followed them for 12 weeks during pregnancy, and what we found is that we actually, um, so we had two groups, one just got all the Educational materials, and then the other group, we actually gave them a forty-dollar Whole Foods gift card. Of the week, so we really wanted to make sure we got some, got some benefit. And um, so, not surprisingly, the women who got the gift card, and we just sort of trusted them to eat more fish, but to use it for fish. It's really like you can't like give a gift card and say, you know, it will only work for fish. But um, so the the control group had no change in their fish consumption over the course of pregnancy, um, and both the education and the education and gift cards increased their fish consumption by um, you know, four to five ounces a week compared to their baseline levels. And they increased their DHA intake by up to 140 milligrams per day in the intervention plus gift card group and 70 milligrams per day in the, just in the education group. And they had no difference in their mercury intake and no difference in their mercury levels either, <clears throat> their blood mercury levels. Um, and so, um, so I think this, you know, it's just a pilot study. It's a small group. We don't have any data on health outcomes. That's the next step. And that's what I think I would like to follow through is say, okay, now we can get people to change their fish consumption. Actually, it's a randomized trial. We don't have to worry about this issue of confounding because we're randomizing them. Is this really um, improving our health outcomes? So that, I might get back to that talk. What you can make grant to do it. But, um, <laughs> you know, but for now, I, you know, my, my sort of simple advice is, you know, eat fish. Try to eat fish, so you get about 200 milligrams of DHA a day. I'm just a big, general, philosophically and database supporter of eating the food. If you get the nutrient food, eat the food, then you have a meal, it tastes good. Um, there's not any evidence that if you eat fish in moderation, and we don't know where that threshold exactly is, but certainly on the order of two servings a week seems to be well within it for most kinds of fish, um, that you will not get in trouble with contaminants. Um, and, but you know, choose lower mercury fish because you want to get more benefit. You know, you might get less benefit if you have more mercury. That's the way I phrase it. Not harm, but just a little less benefit. It will offset the benefit. Um, but if you, you know, if you have a meal from a certain sort of fish, and you didn't know you're pregnant, don't panic. Um, and um, and if you can't or just won't eat fish, you can take a supplement. Although, again, I think the data are not as strong. There there are other outcomes for which supplements are more beneficial. But if you can eat the fish, eat the fish. Um, and so you know, this is. Of one of my friends, today, which I love, which you know, it's not it's not just about the fish. Here's like the smoking woman, the drinking, getting fish sticks, and so much shaming her for eating fish. And so I think you know, dialing back the debate because actually stress is also really bad. <laughs> um, so um, I'm happy to take questions at this point. Or
full, but to avoid, you actually, you know, you got, it, it, we just provided the information that allowed them to, to, to make it positive, so it's not just a That's really the nidus of the concern about these observational studies is that the two groups are just going to be so different. But you know, to the extent that we could uh, statistically adjust for things like um, race and education and breastfeeding, we did that, and it didn't seem to explain. Um, you that doesn't really make much difference. Um, but um, but. Ultimately, you can never really eliminate that concern. I would say in our population, it turns out there was really not a big socio-demographic difference among the fish eaters and the non-fish eaters. It wasn't, they weren't tremendously different. Um, they, they did eat different types of fish, so the sort of higher, um, you know, higher educated women ate more shrimp and the low, kind of lower SES women ate more canned tuna. So it was more than, but the total amount of fish they ate actually didn't seem different. But, Ultimately, you can't, you know, you can try to adjust for these things, it's just a way, I mean, you know, but you really are never fully confident that you're going to be accounting for those differences. For vegetarians, like, what would you advise them to eat certain types of Question. So flaxseed oil has, so the uh, omega-3s, there's a short chain parent omega-3s and then the long chain omega-3s, which are the ones that we think have a particular physiologic benefit. And we can eat, if we eat the short chain omega-3s, um, we get some omega-3s and we can elongate that in our bodies to make the long chain ones, but not very well, and especially you know, the fetuses are not very good at that. And so there's concern that even if you just eat the nut and seed sources of omega-3s, like flaxseed, you're not getting the DHA. Um, I mean, that's it. There are a lot of supplemented foods that have DHA in them. We just don't have, and, and so there are good data for some outcomes, like preterm birth, for example. I showed that study, it did seem to benefit for cognition. The data are not as strong. Um, it's the data that I've seen. I mean, so, so for the one example is um, breast milk has um, the short chain and the long and a lot of DHA in it, sort of depending on how much a mother eats. Um, formula historically has not had DHA, it just had the short chain. Omega-3s, and there were differences in cognitive outcomes between breastfed and formula-fed babies that seemed to be reduced or eliminated when they added DHA to formula. So it seems that there's some benefit to the DHA. I mean, I think ultimately it's individual choice. First of all, again, the, the benefits are not, you know, you're not talking about having a, you know, baby who's like going to come to the e dub versus like mental retardation. I mean, it's not like, <laughs> there's, you know, and there's a lot of other things that like breastfeeding to, you know, ameliorate these differences. So it's hard to say, you know, someone should forego vegetarianism. They really feel really strongly that that's important. Um, but if there's a lot of women, I think, avoid fish because they, yeah, you know, they don't love it or they think it's, you know, they just don't, there's no strong reason that they're avoiding it. And so I think moving a lot of those women in the direction is helpful. But I think if you were really, if you're vegetarian, I probably would. Um, what is the name of the guide that you developed? I just tried to find it on Google and found a bunch of different state specific ones. Um, the um, the brochure yeah. is not really publicly available. Okay. This is about the our research study. If you want it, I'll send it. Um, mercury is in all of the fish, and unlike things like you know, PCBs and other organic pollutants, which are concentrated in the fatty tissue. And so there's some advice that if you really have a fish that's like a big PCB, you should cut off the fat and like not fry it, you know, broil it or do something. 
doesn't matter what the criteria because it's in the flesh. Um, but there, yeah, I'm sure there. You know, it, like if you're looking at cardiovascular health, for example, it's probably worse to fry your fish, regardless of the contaminant. <laughs> Um, but there's just not, we don't know a lot. I mean, a lot of these people have to really like how much fish you eat. It doesn't even get into what kinds of fish are you eating, much less how it compares. So there's a lot that we don't know about. <coughs> Um, so there is a, um, shoot, I'm going to forget this website. There's actually, a, it came up somewhat recently, in effect, after we published our paper, uh, which I really like, um, because it has these nuances, and I, um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it is, uh, I can send it to Trevor, and he can post it. Um, but, um, I mean, like, the, like I said, the state, the Washington State Public Health Guidance is actually pretty good. In terms of developmental milestones that you measured and like the numbers you measured, can you, is there like an observable degree to which these children are different uh, with uh, a higher mercury content than like they're not actually observable? All these yeah. numbers just came from yeah. testing. Yeah, they're all sort of statistical differences. They're not, not like you could look at two kids and say this kid is developmentally Fish consumption patterns and also studies in New York City looking at fish consumption. 
consumption patterns. And definitely, people living on the coast and beaches are the highest risk group for having higher mercury. Um, but they may not care because when, I think you guys have this experience, right? When you tell them actually your mercury is kind of high, you should eat different fish or less fish to say thanks. Um, right? Is that an appropriate characterization? Some, some do change. And we actually have a green population that's very eating fish, but yeah. they are mercury levels much higher. Yeah, but and some. They were choosing different fish. But that's because they were sort of culturally right. choosing it to begin with, not because you told them. Right. No. <laughs> to, yeah. Um, so and I, I should just say, I, I mean, I've presented this talk as if this is really all my work. And obviously, you know, it's not all my work. And there are less people who collaborated with me and whose um, ideas I built. But I just didn't give them so sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's because I mean, you brought up about the um, Asian variants last week. But I work on an Indian reservation, and they actually have, there's a lot of issues right now with fish consumption and trying to get the water quality standard in Washington up to um, a level less protective of like Native American consumers because I mean Native Americans and Pacific Islanders and, and um, Asian Americans have like the highest consumption rate but a lot of times we'll try to tell them you know a lot of like warnings about you know when we take samples it's not necessarily mercury we deal with more it's more like PCBs and other persistent pollutants but um, it's just there's really nothing else to substitute it with and when there is it's usually like if you go to the supermarket and what they can afford it's like that food is usually unhealthier for you than Anything that's like anything that's contaminated, that's seafood related. So it's just, uh, I don't know, it's just kind of like a kind of a hard thing to do is trying to balance a lot of these cultural benefits. And plus, there's like kind of like a spiritual element of you know eating, consuming seafood. So let's grow up the cultural aspect of all this. Kind of interesting to mention that. that I mean, you can you can inform them, but it's, you know what is, what are they going to do? Because if the supermarket, the cheaper supermarket food is available, is much unhealthier. There's the, like the, the seafood is like practically free to get it from, so. And they're probably getting exercise. Yeah. Fresh air, something like that when they're like fishing or not. Yeah, so. Yeah. So we, we haven't, I mean, there haven't been those studies to like really look at the industry. And, and most, of the, most of the, like the Department of Health warnings are, you know, don't eat this, don't do this. But one of the things I saw that I kind of, I kind of liked is that the um, Department of Health and Human Services in Alaska, they kind of have a system where it's like, kind of like a weight watchers thing where it's like these points based on you know, how bad the fish is. So like zero points would be like salmon and then like working your way up to like you know top you know top fish in that world and sort fish which is like twelve points. So they have kind of like an advisor of like what different fish like what different points is going based on how much you know the salmon is they have and what's best to eat for pregnant women, which I think is kind of like the best idea. So maybe last question. Yeah, one more question. So when I saw the Pregnant women, nursing mothers, and young children eat fish. And this seemed to really focus on the pregnant women. So, is there data? I mean, I'm particularly interested in the health benefits and risks of young children eating fish and how much. So, would there be another study on young children or nursing mothers? There are studies, you know, which show that if kids eat more fish, they can get mercury levels that are in excess of what's recommended, but not. <coughs> um, and pregnant women too. There, there, the Faroe Islands actually did measure breastfeeding and mercury and breast milk, and they didn't see any effect of mercury and breast milk associated with any outcomes of the issue of prenatal mercury levels. So it's just kind of an extrapolation. So none of these differences in development or cognition is based on children eating fish once they're born. It's how much mother, how much their mother. And that could be another variable. Right, yeah. So we, I mean, we have looked in our population too at the fish consumption in the kids, and there was no association with it. Either good or bad, no. Although it's may not be that well measured if you want to start to get much of a But um, no, there's no evidence of harm, certainly, for the child fish You know, in the absence of, like, again, a sort of really toxic exposure. Um, so, but it's just extrapolated from the right recognition that the brain is growing somewhat similarly to, you know, it's still taking up BHA in the first couple years of life, it's still growing in a way where we would expect that high levels of mercury would be possible. Say you guys have a pregnant mother eat a ton of fish, but then your child refuses to eat it, you know, versus a child that will eat it and have their differences in development between those two children. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.
אסטרטגי של משלי אמרי, 